almost ready. This meeting is being live streamed and it is okay. Let's get that out of the way. We are live on YouTube. We're starting to get people. Okay, and I wanted to check. Also, Dean, make me uh, co host. Yes, Charlie. Charlie co host. Charlie, you are now the co host. And you will be letting people in, right? Yes. So it is 1101. We're one minute late to get started here. And we are going to start by lighting a candle. Welcome to Community Church of Boston. We light the candle of unity and justice and and the candle of warmth on a cold day and the candle of memory. I want to mention three luminaries that I've just been thinking about this morning. The first one is named E.O. Wilson. We really wanted to get E.O. Wilson to speak here before he passed. He was like in his 90s. Uh, and it didn't happen, but just the most incredible uh, biologist, zoologist, uh, and, uh, popularizer of science to the to the people and saver of of the planet. E. O. Wilson, presente is what I say. The other is named Thomas Lovejoy, and that was another incredible environmental uh, hero and author and um, saver of the Amazon rainforest. Thomas Lovejoy, presente. And the third one, maybe my favorite, Desmond Tutu. And I heard an interview with him this morning, and here's a guy who is so devoid of the, of the self-important hubris that, that high religion is supposed to have, Desmond Tutu, um, whose favorite quote I think should go on a sidewalk uh, uh, on the sandwich board in front, which is, um, if God is homophobic, I want to go down to the other place. Desmond Tutu, presente. Anyway, welcome everybody. And we have um, the beginnings of a physical presence of, of people here in the auditorium. Um, uh, we want to we want to tell you that we are mostly virtual these days, but um, you can come uh, to this beautiful auditorium that we have right in Copley Square. And, um, and not only will you enjoy the, uh, the ambience of the auditorium, which has brand new heating and air conditioning, which we put in in 2021. We're so proud of that accomplishment. It also has this treasure trove of stuff. The first one I, I will show you is stuff that I have brought over years from El Salvador, and it was on sale during holiday. These are called toaster bags. This is, is uh, women from uh, from El Salvador. Teosinte is the name of the village. Here's uh, the next one that sold big this year. It's called an oven mitt. Um, beautiful new item. Here's a, a, a dop kit for all your toiletries when you travel. Beautiful Guatemalan handwoven uh, backstrap weaving cloth. Here's a, we call this a clutch organizer. Clutch organizer, also a big seller. And here is the laptop case. And finally, the one that those ladies started learning sewing with is called a tote bag. And um, uh, they're all, uh, going into tubs and going into storage. I think I'll keep a small collection here for folks that want to come by. The other thing you can see in this auditorium right now is a treasure uh, trove of books, e either a treasure or a trash trove. I'm not sure which, but we have uh, behind us the, uh, the library of the books of Robert Dattilio, who we say presente as well, but he passed away about a year ago. And we have 
taken the decision of taking on all of his books, which not only cover this auditorium's the, half of the half of the auditorium, but also the third floor is filled with um, uh, books on anarchism, communism, socialism, Marxism, Engels, um, Gramsci, all these uh, anarchist uh, authors I've never heard of. Uh, pro Pudom, Kropotkin, on and on, um, and it's it's all here, and it's it's really a feast, and we're just getting it organized and trying to figure out what to do with it because if we're going to go back to a a church that's a sanctuary and a meeting place, we can't have it filled with books, but we love this while it's here. Come by and see this. Uh, we are really inviting you to be part of this decision about what to do with this amazing um, uh, volume of, of volumes of books. Um, and if you want to come by and look at them, we have office hours Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, uh, just uh, make an appointment with me, dean at deanstevens.com or, or the church email address. Crystal Rollins Jackson is our um, office and publications manager. I want to uh, show you the, uh, the beautiful banner that she designed that's right over there, right by uh, Jenny, who's, uh, who's uh, looking through the books. Next, I want to go to the, the of course, the Sacco Vanzetti plaque. As you know, Sacco and Vanzetti are kind of part of community church's DNA. The founding mothers of this church were very involved in the defense of Sacco and Vanzetti between 1920 and 1927 when they were executed. There's another poster that says, Say Their Names. That's by uh, our, our beloved Crystal. There's a Vietnam poster by, uh, or painting by Yosh San Bornmatsu, an artist who had a gallery here for many years. Anyway, that's what is happening at, at the auditorium, Lothrop Auditorium of Community Church of Boston. We're, we're glad to welcome you uh, both on Zoom and on YouTube. I want to introduce Steve Tilston by, um, by reading a little bit of, of um, what what we exchanged in text recently. Um, uh, I am just so glad that Steve joins us. I've loved his music. I've never met him in person before. Um, and and he, here here is what Steve said a couple of days ago. Dean, are you sure you want to include someone with atheistic tendencies in what appears to be a church service? <laughs> and here's my response. We are the church of make it up as you go. We have a really rich and controversial history of good troublemaking. Blacklisted by McCarthy as a communist front, atheism and Satan worship are, and radical Christianity are all welcome. Quaker Unitarian Zen Juthiest, but very Catholic when in the presence of our frequent speakers during the 80s and 90s, the fathers, brothers Berrigan, Daniel and Philip when they weren't in prison. A very different church is what we are. So Steve responded, I think there's room for me then. Please could uh, could you email Hugh your technical requirements and I would like to um, welcome also to the stage Hugh uh, the bass player who's in the back and uh, tech director on the other side of of of, of the the pond they come to us from England and Steve uh, Tilson it's just such a pleasure to have you I want to mention also that I found out recently that Steve is one of the voices on. One of my favorite choral pieces of all time, it's called Traveler's Prayer. And um, oh, yeah. <laughs> with John Renborn and uh, Maddie Pryor, if I'm not mistaken. No, Maggie, and, Maggie Boyle. But... <laughs> Maggie Boyle, yes, yes. Yeah. And that is just such a beautiful thing. And thank you, uh, 40 years later, whenever it was that was recorded, the late John Renborn's piece. And maybe maybe I'll look for it and we can play it right at the very end or something like yeah, that. Yeah, don't ask me to sing it. It was, it no, was no. a hell to sing, that one. It yeah, was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, Steve and Hugh, so glad you're with us. Take it away. Thanks ever so much. Pleasure to be here. Well, privilege to be here. It's a song I wrote called Oil and Water. Oil and water, my wheels, they cry in fret. This old engine is way past tender love and care. Oil and water. 
water don't mix well like whiskey and wine Some concoctions just get you no further down the line Oh, I might never pass this way again I might never get to sing you this song By the time it turns to day again Could have had my dreams gone Smoke and mirrors, we see what they want us to see Such illusions, the way we would wish things to be Smoke and mirrors, the truth gets no easier to read Spend a lifetime repaying those things we don't need Oh, I might never pass this way again I might never get to sing you the song By the time it turns to day again Could have packed my dreams gone We lost this. I accidentally muted you. They, they don't know. Everybody's muted. Well, unmute them. I, 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 you can ask, but you can't do it. Okay. Stephen Hugh, uh, somehow you got muted throughout the, the, the end of the song, and uh, the host cannot unmute you. Do we have you can again? You, can, you, can you hear yes, me now? Yes, yes, yes. And yeah, we, we apologize for that, um, but we certainly heard enough of that song to say that it is a beautiful song. And um, and his beautiful okay. guitar playing. Thank you. And we promise we won't do that again in the next uh, <laughs> next uh, chunk of songs that you'll get to sing uh, in in the next segment. Thank you. That's Steve Tilston, folks from Thank you. Uh, Thank from you. Northern England. And Hugh, tell me again what Hugh's last name is. Bradley. Bradley. Hugh Bradley on bass. He, he will. He will return backup vocals and we apologize to the entire audience for for that uh little little uh trigger happy mute button thing that happened on, on on this end uh and probably will come out on the youtube recording as well um thank you steve tilston and and hugh bradley folks um we are honored to have you with us uh also we are walking on air from last friday night when we had our first 2022 Winter Friday series, which is uh, an upcoming um, three months of, of concerts every Friday night. Uh, our 
Our featured musicians were called Susie Williams and uh, Bill Burnett, also known as the Boners. We loved their music and it's, it's available on our YouTube channel, as is everything that we do here. Um, next Friday, we have an equally amazing performer. His name is Bob Lucas, and he's out of Ohio. And Bob is a longtime friend of mine and has been a, a um, music uh, musician for theater. He has been at the helm of uh, the Mad River Theater for about 30 years. He's just retired, and he's done music uh, for these plays that they put together, um, mostly around African American history, all the way from the times of slavery to the, the heroes of the civil rights era and to Black Lives Matter. Um, and they do beautiful work putting together plays that are, that are put in front of uh, uh, school children all over the country. They've been here at Hibernian Hall in Roxbury and also that huge theater down in New Bedford, Zyterian Theater. So um, that's Bob Lucas, and he will be with us next Friday. Join us. It's the same link that you can, you can link on to. Um, I want to tell you about another e amazing event coming up this Tuesday. Um, that would be January 11th, am I right? Yes. Um, and that is Mazen Kumsia. Mazen Kumsia is uh, joining us from Bethlehem, West Bank, Palestine. Uh, Mazen was going to be doing uh, a live tour. He was going to travel here and, and we were going to host him uh, here at the church. We have a couple of wonderful co-hosts. One is Jewish Voice for Peace and the other is Muslims for Progressive Values, which in normal times meet here in our auditorium. Um, Unfortunately, Mazen wasn't able to travel. He had to cancel his trip because of the virus issues. But he's still willing, believe this or not, to join us virtually from Bethlehem, which this is the amazing thing. It'll be 2 o'clock in the morning in Bethlehem, but he still wants to do it. So will you, will you join us as well uh, on Tuesday night for Mazen Kumsia? His program is called, his, his talk is called, oh, well, I'll give you the name. Mazen, I'll tell you who he is. He's, he's a um, professor of biology and the founder of the Palestine Museum of Natural History. And the gist of his talk, and he's just this wonderful, compassionate, comedic speaker, uh, um, is about doing science in the midst of a brutal occupation. Um, his talk is called Hope, A View from Palestine, Hope in the Midst of Calamity. So uh, will you join us Tuesday night at 7 p.m.? And um, that should be a really marvelous event. And we're just so grateful to Mazen for, uh, for either getting up in the middle of the night uh, to, to deliver this talk or else he's a, a complete night owl. And, and it's, it's, it's right in, in line with, with his life and his work. Uh, so join us on Tuesday for Mazen. We also have coming up some wonderful Sunday programs. MLK Sunday is Charles Coe, the wonderful poet and retired director of the um, Massachusetts Arts Commission. Uh, Charles Coe, who has joined us several times before, music by Fulani Haynes, that uh, force of nature of an 80-year-old um, jazz singer with her uh, remarkable uh, jazz pianist, accompanist named Michael Shea. The week after that, we have an environmental program um, that is about the salmon, wildlife in the Northwest. Um, and it comes from uh, a, a trip that my wife and I took celebrating her retirement. It was a raft trip down the Salmon River, and one of the guides is going to give us the talk about saving the wild salmon on the Salmon River. So join us for that as well. That's January 23rd. Um, I want to do what we always do is uh, a reading. It's not the Bible, but it to me, he's almost the Bible. His name is Eduardo Galeano, and he's a Uruguayan um, uh, author. He passed away about four or five years ago. Um, I've, I've got a whole pile of his books that I love and read, both in English and in Spanish. But this is called Children of the Days, and it has a, a reading for every day of the year. 
Galeano writes mostly in uh, one or two paragraph vignettes, and this one is for January 9th. I haven't even read it yet, and I will read it to you. It's called Elegy to Brevity. That would be a good one for me to learn. Uh, I'm sorry if I've been long-winded. Um, Elegy to Brevity. Today in Philadelphia in 1776, the first edition of Common Sense rolled off the press. Thomas Paine, the author, maintained that independence was only common sense given the humiliation of being a colony and the ludicrous nature of hereditary monarchy, which might as easily crown an ass as a lion. The 48 book, uh, page book spread faster than water or wind and became one of the fathers of U.S. independence. In 1848, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels wrote the 23 pages of the Communist Manifesto, which began by warning, quote, a specter is haunting Europe, unquote. It turned out to be the most influential book of the 20th century's revolutions. 26 pages summed up the exhortation to outrage. Indignez-vous! that Stefan Hessel published in the year 2011. Those few words helped unleash earthquakes of protest in a number of cities. For many days in 2011, days and nights, outraged people in the thousands occupied streets and squares against the global dictatorship of bankers and warmongers. Eduardo Galeano, Children of the Days. Blessed be. <laughs> I love being a fake minister here. Uh, and if I didn't tell you, there's some people I don't know. My name is Dean Stevens, and I'm honored to be with all these wonderful people. I see people in in Maine. I see I see somebody, a certain somebody who joins us from New Zealand, um, and I see a certain few that I don't even recognize. Um, we seem to have lost uh, Steve and Hugh. Steve and Hugh. Oh, there they are. They're already spotlit. Steve and Hugh. Yes. This is called the musical moment. Are, are we uh, back on again? Yes. We're back. I told you the churchy stuff would be very brief. <laughs> what we like is the content, which is y'all and a certain Nick Rab who will be joining us soon. So a couple of songs, if you might. Uh, and, and, and again, yeah. thank you so much for joining us, for joining us uh, from the other side of the pond. No, I'll, I'll watch yeah, out. So is it Yorkshire, exactly? Yorkshire. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Caught me unawares there. This is uh, a kind of a, an optimistic song that was written down the uh, the first lockdown that we had over here, walking on the moors around here. It's called Daylight Rising. Will come rising Fare the long night A last goodbye Daylight Will come rising And an ill wind Lay down to die There will come a time To open wide the windows Get up out of bed and weave across the floor Leave behind the shadows Take those aching bones outside that door Daylight will come rising With the long night a last goodbye Come rising and an ill wind lay down 
times are dying There will come a time to shun all the false faces There will come a time to silence the thought tongues Those that let us into these dark places Knowing that their way was always wrong will come rising with the long night the last goodbye daylight will come rising and an ill wind lay down to die the long night the last goodbye daylight will come rising and an ill wind lay down to die daylight will come rising with the long night Last goodbye Daylight Will come rising And an ill wind Lay down to die And an ill wind Lay down to die And an ill wind Lay down to die Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sing you um, a song that is uh, very much a, an autobiographical song. It's called The Road When I, when I Was Young. And it goes like this. Oh, these traveling shoes are worn tattered. Still keep moving on. They have learned to tread the roots that mattered along the road when I was young. There have been missigns and diversions They searching for the sun Many mislaid plans and missing persons Along the road when I was young Thou man well Chasing dreams in the blue yonder and freely spending time, which was mine to squander along the road when I was young. Many nights alone, some nights together. Some special one, and 
Back behind the wheel and hail forever On the road when I was young My first song, it still lingers Oh, how the notes spill from my fingers And I did stand in line with the folk singers Along the road when I was young Well, no goodbyes for some companions Never realized when time was done Each with our own absolute opinions Along the road when I was young I had guitar was free to travel strands of life did unravel when I sold my soul to the crossroads devil along the road when I was young just down that well worn path I wandered Chasing dreams in the blue yonder And freely spending time to mine to squander On the road when I was young On the road when I was young Thank, Thank you. you so much, Steve. Thank you. Cheers. Your songs uh, go through the phasing issues on the guitar and 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 the voice and and reach my soul. Um, I really am so glad that you and Hugh are here with us today. It's just a, a treat, and I really hope that someday soon we can host you live the way it's supposed to be right here in this auditorium. That would be great, wouldn't um, it? That would be nice. The, the sooner the better. Let's <laughs> yeah, yeah. let's make it happen as soon as uh, the, the air clears and the coast is, yes, is clear. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, on, the way, uh, on, the, on the subject of your young days, 
I want to tell folks that we have uh, a young dude here who, who lowers the mean age of this assemblage by about 30 years uh, in one <laughs> swell foop of, of coming on to our Zoom. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, thank Nick Rabb for, for joining us today um, from the Sunrise Movement. And I, I want to invite him to come and uh, take over the reins of this church. Uh, it, it needs to be young people who are who are doing this um we're we're here to to be taken over um uh, i want to give you a little bit of a um introduction to nick he's worked to bring a voice of ideological clarity and complexity to the climate movement, organizing with the Sunrise Movement's Boston Hub, Mass Peace Action and, the, and dissenters. His work has focused on political education through public workshops and speaking opportunities. His blend of organizing experience working against militarism and for climate justice lends unique insights into the shared systems of domination that extract from people and planet on behalf of the ruling class. He is a PhD student at Tufts University, jointly pursuing a degree in computer science and cognitive science. His university research focuses on modeling the spread of disinformation, why we so readily believe lies and media analysis on the subject of the smoke and mirrors that Steve Tilston uh, sang about in his first song. Nick, we're so glad to, to have you with us today. Um, and uh, folks, uh, let's let's uh, welcome uh, everybody on the Zoom. There's 19 of you and another 10 of you on the YouTube and uh, two or three more right here in, in our auditorium. Welcome, Nick Rabb. All right, Nick, take it out. Take it away. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Um, Stephen Hugh, I was not prepared to like speak after being moved almost to the point of tears. That, those songs are so beautiful. So I'm really, really um, honored to be following you all up. And I'm generally yeah, very honored to be here. So thank you, yeah, Dean, for inviting me here and everyone else who, who works sort of behind the scenes to put these together all the time. It's, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to speak about these things to, to folks who I think will be receptive. Because um, what I'm going to talk about today, yeah, is sort of a culmination of a handful of years of my experience, like um, Dean was reading, I've organized with the Sunrise Movement, um, which is a, I, I don't know if folks need this explanation these days, but yeah, it's a youth-led climate movement that um, has worked for a while to try to bring attention to the climate crisis and sort of move us to a vision of um, climate justice and, and a future, particularly under the Green New Deal, uh, and I also work against, yeah, systems of domination under militarism and um, other forms of state and, and corporate power and my research on disinformation and stuff. So this, this talk today is kind of a culmination of a lot of things that motivate me as a person, like as a human being, uh, actualizing my, my values and principles in this world. So I hope um, some of it resonates with all of you. So uh, I just want to begin with a couple questions to sort of set the stage. So if you knew that your world was potentially heading for disaster on a scale that you could scarcely comprehend, what would you do? What choices would you make? How would you live your life? Well, I'm here to talk about making choices. Uh, the climate crisis has forced many of us into a life of making serious choices that we may not want to make. And as, of, as is often the case in history, our society, I think right now is at a point where it's faced with a difficult choice. Um, I'm going to argue that the youth climate movement, uh, partially driven by Sunrise Movement, successfully shifted uh, the political narrative such that the climate crisis is now taken very seriously as is the need for significant intervention. Uh, that battle is over, is, is what I'm gonna lay out. But now the question remains uh, that I think will determine our future. Uh, what are we going to do about it? And it's not a simple question. It's, it's actually a very contentious question right now. From my perspective, there are two tracks that our societies could take. One where we allow the powerful to shape the response to the crisis. 
virtually guaranteeing its continuation for reasons that I'll explain later, and one where we dig deep and gather as much courage as we can muster and fight for a response that transforms society and dismantles systems of oppression that are causing the crisis in order to secure a sustainable future at the very roots. Now, this argument for change at the roots may sound familiar, uh, not pragmatic or played out, um, but I'm actually going to make a case for the idea that if we do not tackle the climate crisis at its roots, we're actually guaranteeing our own demise. Uh, in my mind, organizing against systems of domination is not just a nice to have kind of thing that can just be done after we fix the crisis, but it's actually key to ending the crisis at all. But I'm also here, as Dean was saying, as a relatively young person. I organize with many folks much younger than myself, but um, I am also someone whose uh, family has been impacted by imperialism and colonialism. I'm an organizer. I'm a researcher. I'm someone who can't help but see complexities and nuances in these issues. I'm also someone who deeply feels the importance of getting this right. Uh, I feel the weight of the stakes almost every day. The suffering that's already underway feels unimagin unimaginably heavy. And seriously considering a future where we fail to take significant action can sometimes be very overwhelming. In a world where the young can often be dismissed for being too emotional, uh, I want to argue that we should be being more emotional. If anything, part of the crisis is a manifestation of widespread emotional suppression, right? That's that which cuts us off from living in right relationship with ourselves, each other, and the planet. But being emotional, letting yourself feel that existential dread, and then finding the courage to ask yourself what you're going to do about it is both difficult and necessary if we're to have any hope of surviving. Uh, young people today in my eyes have had a lot of strange hardships to deal with. And that's not to say that many aspects of life are not much easier or that some people suffer more than others or that other generations have had difficult times as well. And it's also not to say that I myself don't speak from a lot of privilege, right? As a cishet man being white passing, having class and educational privilege. So I can't speak in perfect universals, but I think it's unarguable that many people my age and younger have had a lot, have had to make a lot of difficult decisions regarding how to live our lives. Uh, I grew up in the US uh, as the war in Iraq began and uh, I feared for my family's safety. Um, our Pakistani heritage and their brown skin make us targets for hate. Uh, people my age graduated school into one of the worst economies in decades, difficulties finding jobs, struggling to find places to live that don't bankrupt us, and all while saddled with massive debt for just wanting to have an education. People younger than me have grown up with a fear of being shot at school. And now I and many other young people uh, oh, and all this on top of uh, people who have always had to be afraid of being shot by the police. And now I and many other young people are struggling to figure out how to orient ourselves in a global pandemic. We're afraid to socialize, forced to go to school and get sick with families who may have to work and who endure financial hardship and so much more. This era has been marked by tough times. Uh, we've had to make tough choices, but I think that also can be the superpower of young people because we're strong. We see through a lot of bullshit and we know that we must bring about a better world because ours is plainly wrong. Now, I often encounter people who see how I choose to live my life, uh, thinking about big issues, trying to fight for a better world. And they'll say things like, you know, Nick, why, why are you worried all the time? You should enjoy your life, be happier. Uh, or they'll say, you know, things will work out. You're young. Everything seems like a disaster when you're young. Uh, or I get, well, you know, yes, there are problems, but hey, what can we do about it? Uh, these responses to the anger and dread of young people, I think, are part of the problem. They downplay the severity of what's going on and the boldness with which we need to act. And I recognize that young people aren't the only recipients of these annoying chidings, but in my experience, they seem disproportionately doled out to us. And that's also not to say that young people have all the answers, right? We certainly don't. 
But we have some things that are evident when you ask why the youth climate movement was so That's successful in the good. first yeah, place. Right? We are emotional. We are courageous. Is Pakistani. And we're willing to do a lot to make sure that we have a future. So I hope that as I lay out my argument, you join me and feel the weight and seriousness of these issues. Um, and I guarantee you won't be feeling it alone. So I'd like to start this explanation by going back to the success of the youth climate movement over the past few years. I think it's important to understand how we got here so that we can diagnose where we need to be going. And before I recount the story, I also wanna note that any of the youth climate movement successes would never have happened without decades of environmental and climate movement before it, right? Whether those were local environmental justice fights, pushing environmental science into schools or the work being done to bring attention to the destruction of the ecosystems we live in. This is all what we were building upon when we had our moment. And in 2018 and in 2019, the world was experiencing a series of whirlwind moments that brought new eyes to the climate crisis. Young people all over the world were rising up and declaring that they will not allow their futures to be sacrificed by wealthy oil barons and corrupt politicians. Uh, Fridays for Future and school strikes for the climate swept Europe, right? Known popularly for the activism of, of Greta Thunberg and others. Young people from the global south, island nations, coastal nations protested, struck from school, traveled to UN conferences and told off those who were doing nothing, right? And in the US, young people from the Sunrise Movement sat in Nancy Pelosi's office, were arrested for doing so and showed the country that we were serious. Joined by our young Congresswoman, champion Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we introduced the Green New Deal and held town halls across the country to introduce a vision of a better future, advocating for a federal solution to the problem. And other countries followed suit with Green New Deals of their own. This was the heyday of my time with Sunrise, a time that we felt incredibly powerful as we changed the narratives away from things like carbon taxes and market-based solutions towards federal intervention uh, at the scale of the crisis that was also intersection. And for once, people started to take us serious, right? I met some of my best friends during that first year, felt what it meant to have real community, fighting for what you love and fighting for your future. And I felt what it was like to be able to influence the institutions that govern your life. Right? But those intoxicating times couldn't last forever, unfortunately. See, we put forward a bold vision in the Green New Deal, uh, but we made two significant mistakes, I think, in our organizing that have now created the situation we're in today. We used the language of things like a just transition, right? But I don't think we really knew what that meant. Right? In fact, we used a lot of language and ideas that sounded right, but that we may not have really understood. And the people we were ignoring to some degree certainly had that understanding, uh, even if we didn't listen to them. So I hope to identify some of these faults with grace, honestly, making clear that sure we could have done better, but also that mistakes happen. Most of us never expected to be so successful in the first place. And you know, isn't it the nature of all people to constantly be on a journey of learning. Uh, so I don't mean to argue either that I had perfect clairvoyance by any means. Um, I was also at fault for not properly understanding what was unfolding, but because of my nature and what I like to do, I began trying to understand these things, I think, before uh, a lot of other people. And I'm not an expert climate scientist or political scientist. Um, I think that these are things that anybody can uncover, right? As long as they're willing to embody deep, fiery curiosity and keep asking questions. This investigation of mine led me to see two crucial mistakes uh, and know that they have to be addressed if we're to push the climate movement past its plateau. So this problem of understanding, really deeply understanding what the Green New Deal was, how it would embody the principles of a just transition for our societies and how we would get there ended up being the demise of our moment. In the end, unfortunately, I believe that much of the public, despite having the narrative shift in a manner that led them to understand the severity of the climate crisis, came away believing that something like fixing emissions would be enough. Um, unfortunately, those of us who had the most powerful microphone at the time were not using it to rebroadcast the voices 
who had the clarity we lacked, right? Often the voices of radical black and indigenous organizers. Arguably, we may not have even gotten the platform we did if we had started out with that kind of radical clarity. But I think that the questions that many didn't ask during that period are still relevant today. So we as people and the climate movement generally can move forward. So these are questions that I began to ask and, and start to wonder about these to yourself, I suppose. So I, well, I realize I've been saying Green New Deal a lot. I hope you all know what I mean when I'm talking about the Green New Deal. I will elaborate it like a couple paragraphs down, but uh, just think to yourselves, you know, if you know what the Green New Deal is, this is a critical question. What would the Green New Deal, what would a Green New Deal actually involve, right? What would a just transition of our societies actually bring about? Uh, when we say things like the Green New Deal would build energy efficient and affordable public housing, there are questions that need to be asked after that, right? In whose communities? What would it take to get municipalities to begin building public housing? Or if you say that the nation should be powered by renewable energy infrastructure, how do we address questions of land use, right? What do we do about the exploitative labor and unsustainable land practices that are used to mine resources necessary for high-tech renewables? When we talked about frontline communities being those who would be prioritized in the social transition, how did we propose that that would be done, right? Were we organizing in those communities? What did those communities want for their own future? When I started digging into these questions, they laid bare some of the assumptions and oversimplifications we were making when we talked about a Green New Deal and a just transition. The conclusions indicated that a Green New Deal properly realized would be something that radically transforms the political economy in the United States through things like public housing, public transit, redesigned neighborhoods, widespread use of renewables, local regenerative agriculture, public health care, and more. All while combating systemic oppression and giving power to marginalized communities first. And the just transition was not just a way to say that right, some workers shouldn't be left behind. Uh, but is commonly a framework used by organizers to articulate a need to change from an extractive economy to a regenerative one, from a militarized political control to deep democracy, from exploitation of people to cooperation between people, from consumerism to honoring the sacred, and from society being arranged to protect the property of the wealthy to one arranged to promote human well being. These are deeper visions that most of us. Uh, had not adopted in our movement. They strike to the core of what I think is wrong with the world, not just the surface. But unfortunately, either not enough people or not the right people were asking these questions in a timely enough fashion so that the youth climate movement could adapt and fill in those gaps. But these questions didn't just reveal intellectual shortcomings, uh, but also that our level of organization was not nearly high enough. Uh, to really secure these public goods at a level that would be meaningful, with local control over them, not recreating exploitative practices of capitalism. And in short, more organizing had to be done that wasn't even perceived as relevant to what's, you know, what we thought of as climate organizing, right? Things like community power having to be built to make these things a reality, and building it in a way that would build and redistribute power across racial and class lines so as not to recreate oppression something that many of us had no idea how to do. And in the aftermath of our initial push for the Green New Deal, some organizations did clearly articulate the need for these things, asking or answering those questions with ease. Things like the Red Deal, written by an indigenous collective called the Red Nation, filled in those gaps. The Red, Black, and Green New Deal, written by the Movement for Black Lives, filled in those gaps. They both warned of the dangers of recreating capitalist exploitation of people and land through a naive Green New Deal, and a shallow understanding of how the world works. They also clearly expressed what marginalized organizers wanted from climate justice, and it was not what we at Sunrise were thinking. They called for the right to clean water, right? a place in the economy, the right to land, a right to energy, local democracy, to heal our bodies and the land, to dismantle capitalist and imperialist exploitation. So these visions helped me answer some of these questions and affirmed that I was asking the right ones. And I think that the climate movement writ large and, and people generally need to understand these visions and why they're the right answers to those questions that I listed. So this all frames 
what I see as the first crucial mistake that I think we need to learn from. Uh, because we didn't understand and clearly articulate a deeply intersectional vision of the climate crisis and a solution when the youth climate movement had the microphone, this deep understanding never made it into the popular discourse. And this, this sort of like lack of understanding will lead us into the second mistake I see in hindsight. See, after the initial success of the youth climate movement, uh, the powers that be, and I'll say that a lot, I talk about the powers that be a lot, the powers that be reacted, right? They formulated consciously or otherwise their plan to maintain power, engaging in massive greenwashing and adopting progressive rhetoric while keeping things largely the same. Like I said earlier, the conclusion that many in the public came away with after realizing the scale of the climate crisis is that only emissions have to be cut. Thus the push for renewable energy began. Things like electric vehicles, alternative fuels, and in some cases, public transit and revamping homes and buildings, but hardly anything beyond this. But the climate crisis is about so much more than just emissions, right? Just like I argued that we didn't have a strong understanding of what the Green New Deal would necessitate or what a just transition really meant for our organizing goals. I believe that we also didn't have a strong understanding of all the factors contributing to the climate crisis. Because in fact, the climate crisis is not just a result of emissions. Emissions do lead to warming, but other things do as well. Right? Destroying ecosystems inhibits the planet's ability to regulate greenhouse gases. But the crisis is also not just a warm planet. Right? No, the crisis is actively what happens to people and other species. The crisis comes as a result of extreme weather that kills people or forces them to migrate. The crisis is when food and water become scarce, leading to conflict, political instability, hunger, death, and economic turmoil. So our mismanagement of land contributes to the crisis. Pollution contributes to the crisis. Lack of political stability leads to the crisis. Lack of democracy leads to the crisis over extraction of resources leads to the crisis. Any real solution would address all of these aspects and see the crisis in its complexity, but we only ended up with public recognition of emissions. And now those who have power have jumped on this opportunity. This is what rich billionaires like Bill Gates are doing with their so-called climate solutions pushing forward technologies that are not necessary for saving our future, but yield enormous profits. They write books about these things, are allowed to go on talk shows, and appear as serious intellectuals, while in reality, they are just cruel and calculating businessmen playing with the future of society as we know it. Things like carbon capture, nuclear power are being argued for because they're seen as hugely profitable investments. In reality, they are two markedly non-solutions to the crisis, and they lead to more pollution than they're worth and are largely untested at a scale they're being argued for. But it's not just billionaire so-called philanthropists who are engaging in massive greenwashing. Even Biden's original Build Back Better plan, which is the precursor to the Build Back Better Act, used progressive rhetoric to disguise giving federal funding to private companies in order to allow them to dominate new energy with only some concessions to workers. So our world today is one where a crisis is unfolding. People have risen up, but we rose up with insufficient power and clarity so that now many feel satisfied with so-called solutions that would simply perpetuate the problem and uh, the problems that are leading to climate crisis. The powerful are trying to dole out enough crumbs with the right words to dress them up that many of us feel satisfied shifting the fight to one over those crumbs. Well, and this is a tactic that has been used time and again in US history to re-justify state capitalism in the face of crises of legitimacy. They give just enough to those who rise up so that they're satisfied, but keep the structure of power the same and simply move on to new exploitative ventures. I won't lose you in the details because this talk is already going to be long enough but I hope it suffices to say this much. I encourage you to uh, investigate it if you don't believe me, the history is out there. And this pattern may have been bad enough for other issues throughout history, but for the climate crisis, a non-solution is not just bad, 
but actively guaranteeing the collapse of modern society as we know it. And I'll get into this more in a bit, but because the climate crisis was created by and is perpetuated by extractive industries, a failure to transition energy, land, water, food, housing, and more to public democratic control, this is virtually guaranteeing that the climate crisis will rage on. And remember to return to my earlier framing of the problem, this is the future of society as we know it on the line. This is my future, it's yours, it's your children's, it's their children's. It's already many people's realities. This is nothing to play around with, right? Nothing to do half right or to allow a watered down non-solution to. It's something that needs to be taken with a seriousness that I think many of us are not used to. And what I just outlined, the co-optation of the climate movement by those hoping to profit off of the crisis and the historical pattern of yielding just enough to quell rebellion while keeping fundamental relations the same brings us to the second major mistake to learn from that I've seen in hindsight. Because many youth climate movement leaders didn't have a strong understanding of the historical ways that power has been exercised, particularly in the United States, we also failed to properly anticipate how the systems that exercise this power would kick in to hamper the greatest potential of the climate movement. And just to caveat what follows, I'll discuss systems of power in the US specifically because that's my area of expertise, uh, but these tactics are also taken up by many dominating states. So I encourage you to see the similarities elsewhere. So now I'll lay out how I see power as being exercised against change in the climate movement, the second big mistake that I think we really need to see if we're if we're gonna get this right. Um, my work against militarism helped me come to these conclusions. Uh, understanding patterns of systemic violence and historical and modern imperialism and colonialism in the service of capitalism is crucial to understanding any issue in our world. Problems that are blithely talked about in mainstream discourse today have deep roots in some of the most depraved acts in our history. I think we need to understand violence if we are to understand what's happening to our planet and to those who try to protect it. So I argue in my work that there are two simultaneous crises facing us, one that we talk about often and one that's scarcely acknowledged. The first is the climate crisis, but I believe there is good reason to say that it has a flip side in what I call the domination crisis. So let me lay out the argument for you. Imagine for me, and sometimes imagining can be easier if you close your eyes because this is going to be a little abstract, but imagine for me all the things that I mentioned leading up to the climate crisis, things like emission, pollution, uh, ecosystem destruction, bad political priorities. These end up leading to things like extreme weather, loss of livelihood, conflict, political instability. And this is largely what we see happening all over the world today at a pace that increases every year. But of course, people react to these events, right? This is part of the climate crisis, right? People migrate from land that they cannot live on anymore. When their homes are destroyed, they have to find somewhere else to go. When companies try to construct polluting projects in their homes, people rise up and try to fight back against it. And people also generally see what's going on, get organized and push back. This is what we understand as the climate crisis and this train of thought right, emissions and pollution, et cetera, leading to extreme weather and conflict, which leads to migration and organizing and protest is seeing the crisis in its complexity, right, a series of causes and effects. And those, though those are not the only aspects of climate crisis worth considering, we can mark a clear line between those causes and effects and what comes next. So given migration, and organizing and protest and trying to protect the land, what do we see, right? Well, those in power have typical responses that we have been seeing play out in societies across the world, right? Borders are militarized to push back migrants. Xenophobia is weaponized to justify that militarization. Those who protest polluting infrastructure are painted as radicals or hopeless dreamers or naive young people. 
propaganda is used to dismiss the severity of the problem while simultaneously selling false solutions so that the wealthy and powerful can consolidate their power. And if people push back too much or in a way that really threatens the system, police and military are used to force people to cede their land and futures to corporations who then continue to pollute, extract, and have their way. This reaction by the powerful, done to the ends of making sure that the system doesn't fundamentally change, it protects profits and the power of corporations and states, who then are free to continue to pollute, emit, influence political priorities, and so on. So if you imagined this whole thing for me, it's a loop, right? It's a cycle. And this cycle is what I call the domination crisis. And I argue that it's the flip side of the climate crisis that most of us were not prepared to accept as a reality. But we have a society, particularly in the US, that was founded on exploitation and domination and has since gained so much power as to influence the organization of much of the world's social, political, and economic systems. This again, this is not a hyperbole. This is really how things work. The fact that we have a highly militarized, violent, and dominating world order that is in turn dominated by US power, perhaps the most brutal nation state that has ever existed, makes our climate crisis different than other potential climate crises that could have unfolded. Right? We're not properly seeing the climate crisis if we do not include the cycle of domination and the fact that it stems from a brutal history of domination. The systems that are enacting these reactions by the powerful that I listed earlier were created for specific purposes and are still with us today. And that's why all of this is happening. So to give just a few examples, the police, right, are a system of organized state force that were actually created in the US to return slaves who would run away. Uh, at that time, because people were considered property, this was a system to enforce property rights for the wealthy. It was a system to ensure the operation of racial capitalism. And now they ensure the operation of fossil fuel capitalism, being paid by private corporations to beat up pipeline protesters and ensure the protection of what's called critical infrastructure. In other words, the property of the wealthy. The military itself was created and has been used to ensure access to materials and markets throughout history. First by wiping out indigenous people, and then by moving to kill and control people all over the world so that corporations could expand, profit, and in turn cooperatively bolster state power. Now the military ensures our access to oil will undoubtedly play a role in our access to rare elements used in renewables and overthrows any nations who try to assert their own sovereignty over those resources and threaten US assets. And finally, propaganda techniques have always been used to create hateful narratives like the doctrine of discovery or manifest destiny in order to justify colonialism and imperialism. The modern advertising and public relations industry was actually created from techniques used to increase recruitment for the world wars. And now it's weaponized to dismiss climate science, lie about weapons of mass destruction so the US has access to things like oil, and now currently whip up fear of Russia and China when we should be trying to cooperate to save our future. These systems are still with us today. Whether we see their roots in the racist, colonialist, imperialist history of the US or not. So when I say that we're facing this joint climate and domination crisis, I mean that we have the crisis that we do precisely because the US has this brutal history of colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism. All of those systems I just outlined, the police, the military, propaganda, and, and other things like economic hierarchy were created to build violent nation states that would ruthlessly serve state and economic interests. Now those same systems are preventing, preventing us from radically changing society to avoid climate catastrophe because they still serve the same purpose, right? protect the powerful, continue to enforce extraction. This may all seem abstract, but it has manifest for the US climate movement in the past few years in some landmark moment, moments that I've seen, participated in, and reflected on. So I talked a lot about the Green New Deal earlier, right? The Green New Deal was initially incredibly popular 
across party lines, even with conservative Republicans. Everybody supported its programs because it made sense. Several studies that I saw came to this conclusion. But from when it was introduced in early 2019 to just a few months later, April 2019, support among right-leaning people in the US dropped precipitously. People on the right were those who ended up hearing the most about the Green New Deal because Fox News and other right-wing media whipped up a serious propaganda campaign to paint it as a socialist, expensive, utopian nightmare. And also people on the center left uh, from liberal media heard the least about the Green New Deal as mainstream liberal media essentially boycotted any discussion of the topic. This is one reason that we failed to bring the public to a complex understanding of the climate crisis or to an intersectional solution. Systems of propaganda are too practiced at vilifying any vision that they see as too threatening to the status quo. Uh, there's another example of propaganda in climate migration. But if you remember back to the migrant caravan in 2018, there was an intense propaganda campaign from the right painting people fleeing climate-induced resource scarcity as murderous gang members or disease-infested people. Uh, liberal media humanized these migrants, but maybe reported that the climate crisis was uh, forcing people to migrate. But most media failed to mention that the countries that most of these people were coming from, like Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, are countries that have been devastated by US imperialism through political coups, orchestrated so that US companies retain access to and ownership of important markets in Latin America. And if people are susceptible to this type of propaganda and we don't organize to educate and give people a true model of the world, then our fights will be futile and spun against us every single time. Uh, another example, the police were on display during, this, uh, during a fight this past summer against the Line 3 pipeline in Northern Minnesota. In the culmination of a multi-year organizing campaign led by indigenous women and two-spirit organizers, many were moved to put their bodies on the line to stop the construction of a huge tar sands pipeline that would inevitably spill toxic sludge into rivers that support indigenous communities materially and culturally. Moreover, this was an illegal pipeline built by a Canadian multinational corporation in violation of treaty, light, treaty rights which are the highest law in the land in the US, which were granted to indig indigenous people in this area. But when attempting to enforce these treaty rights and protect the land, indigenous and non-indigenous protesters were brutalized by local Minnesota police who were paid millions of dollars by Enbridge Corporation who was constructing the pipeline. Police used torture tactics on protesters, shot them with rubber bullets, all in the service of protecting a tube of metal that is actively contributing to the collapse of our societies. If we don't recognize the need to anticipate police repression when we push the system too far, we will never address the climate crisis. And finally, systems of economic domination and political control have been made clear during this entire ordeal surrounding the Build Back Better Act and the Biden administration overall. Right, the Build Back Better Act started off as a three and a half trillion dollar bill uh, spent that, spending that over 10 years with social programs that were certainly laudable and some climate investment. I certainly supported its passage uh, as, a, as a big step, but it's nowhere near enough, right? Several economic evaluations conclude that we need on the order of $1 trillion per year, not $350 million per year, in climate investment alone for 10 years in order to truly transition the economy to a de degree commensurate with the threat but coordinated bodies of corporations spent hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying, and propagandizing against the bill and buying out politicians who inevitably ended up whittling it down and are now blocking it indefinitely. This was for something that equates to $350 million per year, not $1 trillion per year. Wealthy corporations have almost every means available to them to shape the political reality, and weak administrations like the Biden administration are not willing to curb the influence of private power. So without seeing this clear sign, or this as a clear sign that we need intense amounts of organization in to counter this type of influence, we will ultimately fail in the fight to save our future. Dean, am I running out of time? You could go on all day if you wanted, but uh, whenever you're done, um, please, uh, we're, we're ready to, to thank you. <laughs> okay. I have a little bit left. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. This is this is a movable feast. Take what time you need. Okay, great. I wasn't sure if the unmute was, uh, I was getting the hook, but there's only a little bit left. Uh, so um, I just wanted to name these because these examples of the domination crisis are playing out before our very eyes. They're co uh, these are coordinated, entrenched, and powerful systems with roots in our country's violent history that are ready to mobilize against something that threatens their power or profits. And to me, that makes clear that we need to be fighting these dominating systems as well if we want to secure our future. And this is something that will require an enormous amount of organization, clarity, and power. So this brings me finally to the choice that I alluded to earlier. As a climate movement and as a people, what do we choose to fight for as our solution to the crisis? Do we accept the need for fighting systems of domination and oppression, putting everything on the line to boldly claim that the climate crisis will never be solved without an intense struggle for liberation? Or do we leave the discussion at emissions? Let the powerful and dominating shape the course of the future and guarantee for ourselves a climate catastrophe and unimaginable suffering. I think the choice is clear. But then how do we do it? So I'd like to conclude by briefly articulating my vision of what we should be doing. And I'd also like to make clear that uh, this the part of the point of this talk uh, to me is also to inspire each of you to ask that question. What am I going to do? And take a journey of your own to answer it for yourself. And as one final caveat, I'd, I'd like to make clear that while I articulate a vision for how I think we should be going forward, I also know that it's important to balance being a human, which is hard enough, and that pushing back against the world takes a lot of energy. Um, but also acknowledge, acknowledging that, it's also true that people have seen through the ethics that I'm about to talk about throughout history and in much more difficult circumstances than ours. That is certainly true of my ancestors, so I know that it can be true of me. We can certainly do it. I'm confident of that. We have done it before, we can do it again, and we can lean on each other in the process. Uh, my vision for our tactics takes inspiration from those frameworks I mentioned before, the Green New Deal, the Red Deal, the Red, Black, and Green New Deal, the Just Transition Framework, and so much more. I think that these plans share common elements that are supported by the problems I laid out earlier. So the first point is that we need a clear understanding of the problem. I hope that I could help provide some of that today, but understanding is a long process that is iterative as well. My model of the world will no doubt sharpen over time, as should yours. We can work together to share those understandings with each other so that we're on the same page regarding what we're up against. Another point is that once we have a clear picture of what's happening, we need much more organized power in order to push back against hugely entrenched systems of domination. This power needs to be across multiple areas, economic, intellectual, communal, labor, political. So this doesn't just mean voting better, but building association in our local communities, engaging in widespread education, building labor organization in the workplace, and redistributing resources like money and housing and food or whatever, so that people have the ability to organize without being hampered by resource scarcity. We need to use our own communities whether those are place-based or across space virtually to practice building that power every day. How would we ever do it at a national scale if we can't do it with the people we know best and see every day? In our communities, we can practice deep democracy, right? making sure that we are seeing out a cooperative ethic that distributes power and resources equitably. We can do this in our workplaces, our schools, our homes, our families, anywhere but we crucially need to bring people into this process of building a better world. It cannot be done for people. It needs to be done by people. Only then will we have the type of deep interdependent power that we need to change the world. We also need to be dogged in fighting against dominating systems, whether those be the police, military, corporate and state propaganda, economic inequality, or whatever. We need to fight back against their motivating ideologies in white supremacy, and patriarchy, and capitalist exploitation. We can boycott these systems, organize against them, divest from them, and build new institutions that are not 
dominating. The climate movement should join in solidarity with movements against police, imperialism, and neo-colonialism because their success is integral to addressing the joint climate and domination crisis. And I'll also go so far as to say that it's not just good enough to simply hear me say these things and agree with me intellectually, but that we have to deeply feel that these things are true, believe that we can actualize them and live by them as guiding principles throughout our whole lives. At any given point, there's no way for me to tell you exactly what we should be doing. But knowing that whatever the circumstances, each of us needs to be building power in others, democracy in all of our communities and institutions and fighting against domination. This will allow us to figure out the specifics within a framework where we are always moving towards our goal. And if we really feel these things emotionally, and remember that we are right because we are fighting for our survival, for some semblance of a future, then we will be moving towards them no matter what. This is what I see and call as an ethic of integrity. By integrity, I mean that our whole being is cohesive and dedicated to these values. They're integrated into our hearts and souls and made manifest in our actions. We need to have integrity in that we are committed to fighting for these goals in all the areas of life we occupy. As I said before, in our communities, families, households, schools, churches, workplaces. We need to be integrated into each other so that we are building power in each other, practicing interdependence and constantly organizing groups of association so that we can exercise our power in solidarity and synchronicity. And as I mentioned a few times already, if you're looking for plans to follow, look no further than the most oppressed groups for the right plans. Many Black and Indigenous organizers have brilliant visions for how to use your ethic of integrity to work towards climate justice. Many organizers of color generally and immigrant organizers often understand better the systems of domination intertwining with the climate crisis and can lend guidance. Those who are poor, low income, or unionized workers understand economic oppression and have the right ideas. Feminine, trans, and queer organizers understand fighting against patriarchy and other ways of being dominating. There are so many resources out there, but it's up to you to commit to an ethic of discovery, rediscovery, and action. So as I leave you today, I'd like to invite you to join me in just kind of closing with a short meditation and a grounding. I'll invite you to close your eyes if you wish, and forgive me, Dean, for stepping on the toes of the churchy aspect of today, um, but close your eyes if you wish and settle into your soul, whatever that means to you. Take a breath and engage that mechanism of feeling. Remember what I said about the severity of the crisis and the height of the stakes. It may feel heavy. These systems are powerful. But now feel whatever it means to you to feel powerful, to know that you must fight against them and that you can win. Feel that many have done it before and that we can do it again, that you can do it. I have been very honored to be with you today. So thank you so much for listening. Am I unmuted? I believe I am. In the Milky Way on a spiral arm, our solar system, this is no false alarm. Heed the call and listen. Shout it from the mountain type tops, write it on the wall. The warning signs are loud and clear. Answer the call. Forest green and ocean blue bathed in starlight. This is our only home, our cosmic birthright. Shout it from the mountain tops. Write it on the wall. The warning signs are loud and clear. Answer the call. Billions of creatures, great and small, roam across her surface. Believe it or not, we could save it all, or we could shut down the cir circus. 
shout it from the mountain types, write it on the wall. The warning signs are loud and clear. Answer the call. Mothers, daughters, fathers, sons, your hand is on the lever. Our chance will not come again. It's truly now or never. Shout it from the mountain tops. Write it on the wall. The warning signs are loud and clear. Answer the call. Answer the call. That song is written by Deborah Silverstein, and I use it to bring back for one last song, Steve Tilson and Hugh Bradley. I want to also just let you know that in the chat is our address. You can write us a check and send it through the US mail. You can also go to our website and uh, there's a PayPal option as well as a credit card option. Uh, we need your help. One thing that we're working really hard on, we own a five-story storefront building in Copley Square and we aim to make this a state-of-the-art example, a shining example of a energy efficient building for the city of Boston for similar sized um, buildings. And we're trying to do that with our own resources as well with as with um, uh, grant funding from uh, several other places. So you can help us do that. Meanwhile, I want to thank uh, a few very generous donors who without any prompting used the occasion of the end of one year and the beginning of a new year to send us some uh, some very generous contributions you know who you are i'm not going to spotlight you or anything but i we thank you um community church is here for you and you have been very generous with us steve tilson we're just so honored to have you, and we hope that this is not the last time. Hugh Bradley, thank you for being our um, uh, our uh, technical advisor <laughs> from the other side of, of the pond. <laughs> and um, we get to hear one more song from Steve and Hugh. Well, hopefully this is a bit uh, appropriate from the uh, um, reading, we, well, the speech that we just had. And, uh, this is called The Reckoning. Thanks for inviting me, by the way. Here's to all the grandchildren yet to be born, great grandchildren, all their sons and daughters, and their own grandchildren, too. I offer you this hand out across the ages, spanned a misbegotten plan to leave. Reckoning to you It's written in the troubled skies We've been telling lies Lies The poison peaks Sorry, I forgot. I'm going to have to sing you another one. This is this is not. Uh, I can't remember this one. Uh, I, I chose it because it was appropriate, but I've not uh, played it for a while. So I'm sorry about that. So. <laughs> next time, okay? Bob? Yeah. Hear that next time. It's a beautiful song. of the wind are a mystery to me see the waves forward dash in a clash between the land and the sea and the warm air does rise and the cold rushes in but it gathers the grit sucks out the sand scours the skin back in the dark age when the world it was flat a great saucer of life that was balanced upon an elephant's back in the words they were writ and chanted out aloud Heaven was waiting somewhere above the billowing clouds. All in the days gone by, before we dared to fly.
to fly Up and lip and high from the ramparts of Eden's walls, there's many a fall. Ah, the apple was sweet, and so we bit deep. But one part was sour, and there lay the power of double speak. Some things we never were supposed to learn. Get down on your knees. Don't question these laws. But the cat fled the bag, went out on the prowl, discovered its claws. in a clash between the land and the sea Thank you. <laughs> Hugh Bradley. Steve Tilson. Have I been muted this whole time <laughs> while I was gushing, waxing poetic about Steve Tilson? Was I muted? Um, I hope I wasn't, and I hope I'm not now. Uh, thank you, Steve and Hugh, for joining us today. Pleasure. And I thank hope you. we see you again soon. It's just it's just incredible inspiration to to me and to all of us, uh, your your music and your and your message. Uh, I hope we get to hear that entire song dedicated to your great grandchildren uh, on the next round because the part that I heard of it heard was was just beautiful. <laughs> yes, Nick, it's a shame I've <laughs> it's a shame I forgot it, but it's it's. Um... Believe me, I've been there before. <laughs> uh, Nick Rab, you you are also an inspiration to us. Um, yeah, very much. Uh, yeah. We. We are, are all ears to young people to tell us old farts <sighs> how to change and how to, how to make this thing run right and, and run better and run sustainably. Um, uh, we have this chance 
congregation to um, talk to Nick. Nick, by the way, is a is a Tufts University uh, PhD candidate, and um, and ask him whatever we'd like to um, ask him. I see Rudiger's hand up. Rudiger, go ahead and unmute, and I will spotlight you. Yes. Yes, I fear that um, we would go without uh, discussion here. Uh, and Mr. Till should know that this is uh, one of the uh, few churches or communities where we have a discussion afterwards, and not about one person, but about the whole world and, uh, and thousands of issues. Um, uh, one small announcement to Dick Crawley, he should uh, uh, contact me, so that I see him that he is alive, and thanks God, so I worry that he was not alive. Anyway, to Mr. <laughs> Till, I have you a question, uh, so many questions, but ne nevertheless, um, I missed a little bit, thank you for the nice talk, but I missed a little bit the uh, a concrete um, action uh, which we should take and then also maybe you mentioned uh, my dream came through my theory came through um, which you uh, you still uh, go to the wave of democracy of the ultimate good um, government uh, and my version is when it comes to climate change no we don't need cover, uh, democracy because we are we are uh, populated the earth with eight billion egoists really simple egoists we are all and so we need um, a dictatorship about wise people no? so let's see um, what is your intake of this and what would be your your practical uh, implication so as a youth uh, maybe new thoughts um, what we can do uh, practically in our tiny tiny world which we are yes, around uh, is that question for me Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you for the it's question. Fun. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, sure, I mean, I'll, I'll go in a reverse order, I suppose. So uh, I hope I uh, articulated uh, maybe in an interesting way that um, actually under the systems that we, we have right now, these sort of dominating systems at the service of, of capital uh, that, that have roots in imperialism and colonialism, I actually think that we, we have more of a dictatorship of the few than we think. Um, I hope that I persuasively argued that a lot of solutions that are advocated for by people who have been start, historically oppressed uh, and have been part of uh, the margins and marginalized um, have not been able to actualize their, their values uh, and visions of uh, a just future because precisely we do have uh, a system where a few end up dictating the plans of what we need to do. So then we end up with Bill Gates's who say we need to um, inject mushrooms into our steel and concrete or some other bogus stuff like that. Um, so I think that being said that um, the reason I argue for uh, democracy as the only way to sort of solve these problems and I should be clear that I mean democracy, not simply in the way of um, majority vote, in, in the way that it's sort of popular, popularly conceived of in this country, sort of ratifying decisions that are already made by the powerful. Uh, I mean it as active participation in community and shaping uh, the distribution of, of resources that are created by forming associational groups like societies or like communities and that everybody is engaged in active deliberation and participation in order to form the plans that eventually get ratified via voting. So that's, that's I mean it more as an ethic of democracy, sort of in the way that um, if you ever read John Dewey, he, he articulates it. So, so the reason I think that that's important is because we are specifically dominated by the, this sort of minority of the opulent that is not fixing the climate crisis but the, I think that if normal people were to form massive groups of association to build bottom up community democratic power that normal people would come to these conclusions very easily. Like I said, I'm not, I'm no like political science genius. I just happen to read a lot and ask what I think are pretty good questions. Um, and that like we need to engage after we ask those questions and figure out those answers in the power building necessary to uh, enforce our will on the minority of the opulent 
who is currently um, uh, effecting a sort of uh, dictatorship that will sort of guarantee this climate catastrophe. So I see democracy, deep democracy and power building as a means to um, uh, overcome that. And, and in the specifics, I, I really do mean engaging in community organizing and, and joining groups that are sort of pushing for these things that would be part of this vision of a just transition or a Green New Deal, groups like those who are uh, organizing for, for Black Lives, or groups like Sunrise or groups like 350 uh, or groups like, I don't even know. There's so many organizational groups um, that, that serve the interests of communities and build power in people and engage in types of um, discussion that, yeah, I always just tell people to join groups, join groups, and then it'll do the, that'll do the rest for you. Uh, that was a great question. Thank you. I want to again invite folks to, to come to this auditorium and browse our enormous book library, bookstore, uh, uh, trash trove, I don't know what to call it yet, but I've been really enjoying having it here and I want to share that with, with everybody. We have half, uh, a, um, half an auditorium full of books and uh, a third floor that has tons of boxes still waiting to be um, uh, unboxed and, and, and sorted out. So uh, come help us do that and, and help us figure out what we're going to do with, with this wealth of books. Um, let's see, are there any, uh, I see Charlie's hand up. Uh, Charlie, our, our president and, and tech guru. Go ahead, Charlie. Hi, um, I just uh, wanted to ask you, uh, her, uh, your impressions of uh, China and what they're doing for uh, to combat climate change. I know there's plenty of issues with China, but I think they don't get the credit they do deserve for being the uh, probably the leader in all these solar panels were built in China and they put together uh, uh, probably more green energy than any place else in the world. Uh, you know, they're still running coal plants, but uh, they've stopped building them any place else in the world. It's a, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but I don't think they get the credit for what they do. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll caveat it uh, by saying, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not much of an expert on, um, you know, how China is handling the climate crisis, but I, I, do, I do happen to know a little bit. Um, I would certainly give you that I think China deserves more credit than this nation would ever give it because particularly because at the moment uh, the state and, and corporations are whipping up uh, quite an intense propaganda campaign against China in order to sort of like create a new uh, villain to sort of mobilize political priorities against now that the war on terror has been decided that that's, that's not the thing to sort of prioritize anymore. Um, so, so for that reason, we will, um, you know, even if even if China was not doing great, we would never give it any credit um, because uh, of that type of propaganda campaign being spun up. And then, yeah, to your point of, you know, China being a leader in um, sort of the production of solar panels and research into the technology of renewables, and you know, they're doing they're doing quite a few infrastructure projects as well, like the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's certainly a mixed bag. Uh, they're sort of, in my mind, their form of sort of state capitalism, because we, we should not be sort of fooled by the idea that they're, you know, sort of a totally communist nation. That's absolutely false. They're just sort of a, a state capitalist nation, just like ours with, with sort of different ways of doing it. Um, they certainly have been more successful than, than us in doing some of those technological aspects, but I think they've been uh, just as sort of lacking and, and depraved as we have in sort of hiding underneath the sort of like flashy renewable energy kind of technology things. Um, no such projects of sort of liberation of the potentialities of people or, you know, sort of de uh, engaging in anything like, like degrowth or, or sort of re, um, what is it called, regenerating the land or contributing to uh, projects like that. 
though they have given more aid and, and funding to the global south than the U.S. has, which is another laudable point. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's sort of playing on my argument that the climate crisis is a manifestation of systems of domination just as much as it is of systems of um, just, you know, pure emissions and pollution. That some of China's initiatives, because it is a state capitalist nation that's really vying to compete with other global superpowers, will end up perpetuating the same kind of domination that, that we see and fight against here. So it's certainly a mixed bag, and I would give them more credit than would ever be given to them from, from this country. But I think we do have to be careful in, in what we're talking about, that you know emissions and renewables are really not the entire picture. It's a great question, though. Let's see. Uh, anybody else? If you have something you want to put in the chat as well, we can we can do that, um, and we can go on and on. It's only limited by the hunger that we feel for uh, pupusas, which are served every, every Sunday by uh, Luis Guzman, our uh, Salvadoran cook and janitor. Um, let's see. Is there anything in the chat? Let's check it out. Um, mostly th thanks and and uh, admiration for how thought provoking and comprehensive your your talk has been, um, especially regarding the need for collaboration of vulnerable populations like. Uh, people of color and indigenous organizations and the good ideas that they can uh, give to us. Um, yeah, it looks like we're, uh, we're in good shape to, to end at a good hour. Like I told you, Nick, um, sometimes we are, uh, we are done at this time. And sometimes like with Daniel Ellsberg, we go on for three hours. Um, and Nick, I, I I truly hope you get a chance to to come down to the church and and visit and say hello in person. And I, and I extend that same invitation for all of you. We have office hours here Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, I'm often here on on other days of the week as well. So be in touch, Dean at DeanStevens.com, and I'd love to uh, to show you these these books and also show you. The, uh, the dreams we have about converting this building into a state-of-the-art um, beacon of, of energy efficiency for the rest of the city of Boston. Um, let me see. I'm going to take one final look at everybody, see if there's any other. Uh, do I happen to see Rudiger's hand up again? Go ahead and unmute Rudiger. And while he does... It's my one one final one final thank you to Steve and Hugh who are on the on the screen there. It's been great being with you and uh, we will we will talk to you again soon. Just an inspiring musical contribution to this program. Uh, uh, one small small um, plea for give and take is uh, if you can uh, ask uh, um, Tip uh, to uh, submit his. Uh, um, um, transcript that would be great i think uh, uh, you have a transcript uh, nick yes um and to give is um a look into harvard um just uh, one week ago uh, put a report out that climate change um uh, a report uh, can be solved by dictatorship so uh, also there, there is the harvard report i forgot to mention it so that was my dream come through, or, or my not my dream, my 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 thoughts. My dream, it's not probably not my dream, probably. Oh, anyway, that's uh, this I want to give you. Mm -hmm. yes, Harvard yes. study. I would add, send us a copy of the transcript so we can add it to our archives, which go back a hundred and two years. Of of uh, the, you will be in in company with the likes of Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and and Martin Luther King and and Thurgood Marshall. So consider yourself honored. Yeah, I'll certainly send that along. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we are uh, wrapping up here, and I can smell the pupusas. Uh, and again, I say, uh, feel free to come down on a Sunday 
We try and be um, COVID safe uh, by masking and encouraging vaccination and uh, and um, uh, booster shots, uh, all that stuff, and um, and working on doing the proper ventilation of this building. We have brand new heating and air conditioning, um, and um, and you're welcome to come down. But we also understand your your um, reticence about being here personally, and we are glad that this technology allows us to reach you um, through your, your computer. So again, Nick, thank you. And once again, I say, shout it from the mountaintops, write it on the wall. The warning signs are loud and clear. Answer the call, Deborah Silverstein, and answer the call, especially when it's coming from the young people whose future this is more than it is ours. Thank you, Nick. Everybody, do good work. Keep in touch. Stay safe. Thank you. We love you. Meeting in the building, soon be over, all over this world. All over this world, all over this world. Meeting at the building, soon be over. Amen, hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Stephen and Hugh. Amen. Thank you, Nick Rabin. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah.